Too much comp competition for dwindling non-clinical jobs? Sham telemedicine companies taking advantage of desperate doctors? We're going to talk about the pitfalls to choosing a non-clinical career, as well as possible solutions on this episode of Bootstrap MD. Hey guys, this is Dr. Mike Wuming with Bootstrap MD. Uh, really excited today. We're going to be talking with one of the veterans in the industry. I've known her. We've been in different circles, but we didn't actually get to connect until recently. We've both been involved in uh, physician education in terms of helping doctors with non-clinical uh, careers and uh, entrepreneurship. And I, what I want you guys to get out of this is really to... Um, understand that there are so many ways that you can, you know, become successful. But the best way, I believe, is to have a coach or have a mentor, someone who's actually been there and, and done that. And Michelle has certainly done this. Um, really quick bio, Michelle Much Riley, she's a physician and peer mentor coach. She spent the past 13 years assisting physicians and medical students with career strategy through the company she founded in 2008 called Physicians Helping Physicians. The doctors she worked with are interested in using degrees in a non-traditional way, as I mentioned, through non-clinical careers, optimizing their skills and passions within their career, and rediscovering meaning and purpose in their work. Uh, she's been called the doctor's doctor in the 2010 book. She co-authored because of her success in working with other doctors. The, position, the book is called Physicians in Transition. I love things that rhyme. <laughs> Dr. Mudge Riley, she received a medical degree from Des Moines University Osteopathic Medical School and her master's degree in health administration for Virginia Commonwealth University. Michelle, thank you for being on the podcast today. Hi, Mike. I'm so happy to be here. Like I said, uh, we've known about each other. I've known, at least known about you for you know the last decade because when we were helping physicians, there were very few other mentors in this space. So I'm really glad that uh, we're finally connecting. And, and one of the reasons we're connecting is uh, I was honored to be able to present at her uh, conference that is coming up, the Celebration Networking Meeting coming up in Austin in April, which we'll be talking about uh, throughout the call here today. But um, thanks again for, for coming on the call. And um, I know you're, you, you know you're really busy, got a lot of things going on, especially with this conference. Um, I just wanna know, how did you first get started? Because last time I checked, there wasn't a residency for non-clinical careers mentor coaching <laughs> forgive me if I'm, that, that that's not right <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh i know well i started very accidentally so I, I planned to be a doctor and live happily ever after um that that was the plan which probably is most of our plan um most people's most physicians plan when they go to medical school um and is uh, happens to now kind of a lot of us it is wasn't the plan so I ended up um, getting into somewhat of a malignant residency, and I, well, I loved med school. When I started meeting uh, the residents and the attendings and the other physicians who were practicing, uh, I saw how unhappy they were, and I was pretty unhappy myself, and I thought, wow, all this, so the next 40 years, I can be a miserable, angry person who hates what they do? Um, I thought, there's no way I'm doing this. So. I was young and I decided to take a year off and kind of see what else was out there, explore industry. I got a job at a medical device company and um, fully intended on going back. And, um, you know, it's been almost 20 years and I haven't gone back. So what ended up happening was I, I went back to school um, for a business degree, a master's in health administration just to kind of fill some of those gaps because we don't learn business at all in med school as we all know and during the time of my transition from that from the device company then to a brokerage firm working in corporate wellness i was their director of medical management um, and i worked with small and medium-sized companies helped helping them design implement and evaluate their wellness programs I started talking about my story and writing about it. And um, I, I actually cold called some editors and 
they said, sure, write us a piece and we'll publish it. And this was back in the early 2000s. So physician burnout was just starting to be talked about. People wanted to hear a little more. I was somewhat of a novelty. Um, I was authentic and kind of just spoke about my my trials and tribulations, if you will, and um, people liked it. I, I always put my email address at the end, and um, I would get contacted by other physicians, and then people who were doing conferences asking me to speak, tell my story. So it was all quite accidental. Um, I just basically told the truth and talked about what had helped me, how I did a resume, how I went to Barnes and Noble and saw like a hundred resume books and didn't have a clue on how to even start to put together a resume, but I figured it out. And so these triple boarded surgeons were calling me and saying, Hey, can you help me write a resume? <laughs> and yeah. I thought, well, sure. All right. So for a while I just kind of helped people. And then I realized, you know what? this is taking up a lot of my time. So at one point I just said, you know, I charge for this. And the physician was like, Oh, okay. And I was like, okay. And my business was kind of born. And so over the years I've had multiple different cost structures for um, coaching and help with resumes and elevator pitch and, you know, LinkedIn comes along and all these different things. Um, but I, for some reason, it's always worked, and I have helped a lot of physicians, and that's been so gratifying. And um, through the process, kind of healed myself as well, because you know I felt like a huge failure, and like why don't I want to do this? Um, because there weren't a lot of us out there. I didn't really know who to talk to, and there weren't a lot of groups like there are now. So I very much felt alone at the time, probably like you did, right? Pretty, pretty much. Uh, one of the things that was interesting is I actually didn't find a lot of conferences where you could actually talk about some of these things. Um, some of the medical conferences that I was attending, I actually had one where um, they asked me to speak, but then when I was going to talk about um, entrepreneurship or doing something else, uh, one of the people uh, who led the conference says, and they were in the, the pharmaceutical industry, basically said that yeah, that's kind of not what we want to talk about because we wanted doctors to kind of want more prescriptions and kind of do what they want. It's not, <laughs> not so uncertain terms. So yeah. it's good that you were able to find an avenue for your message that you were able to get across. Yeah, I, I really think it was all just timing and a lot of luck. And again, I didn't plan it that way. It just kind of happened. And as you know, then the tide continued with things getting even worse, which is really unfortunate. So back even in the early 2000s when things weren't great, now they're much worse for doctors. And so um, there are a lot of us that are kind of saying, no, this is enough. We're, we're going to diversify what we're doing or we have other interests. And so doing a lot of different things in addition to clinical work. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's interesting you say that it's getting worse because I can agree with that, but I can also disagree with that. Um, and let me know your thoughts on it. I think yeah. one is we're talking about it more, so maybe it's been more prevalent. Um, and, you know, burnout and then, you know, more and more people feel like, hey, yeah, I'm experiencing that. Um, because I did that initially in, in my career, you know, I, I definitely had, had burnout. But I think in the other way you look around, there was definitely more opportunities for physicians uh, especially the non-clinical route in terms of things like telemedicine, teams of um, pharmaceutical industry, uh, expert witnessing, and actually now about kind of starting your own career through like an online business or through consulting, as, as, which we kind of did around about way we didn't call it, back, call it it back then, but, you know, all these, you know, different conferences about, you know, uh, finding, getting your message out into the world. So just curious your, your thoughts on, you know, where you, where you kind of seeing medicine as it, as it pertains to non-clinical careers. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I definitely agree that things are better in terms of more opportunities and more people talking about this. It's not the pink elephant in the room anymore, and no one feels like something's really wrong with them, at least maybe at first, but not after they start exploring it. They start to recognize that there are lots of doctors who have done something different, some who have gone totally non-clinical and never looked back, and some who diversify with some clinical, some side gigs, some part-time work, kind of a variety of stuff, a grab bag of, of stuff. Um, the reason I feel like it, it's worse, though, for physicians now practicing is because 
the reimbursement continues to go down. So right. not only that, but the environment for physicians is very malignant in a lot of places. And it wasn't that way. It was, it was starting to be that way in the early 2000s, maybe a few pockets of really bad places, but it has gone downhill. And I continue to talk to physicians who practice, who tell me stories about how they're vilified and how no matter what happens, it's always the doctor's fault. And that just makes me really sad because a lot of these doctors will start to have a very low self-esteem, um, very low confidence in themselves because they blame themselves because they're being blamed by the administration or the nurses or, you know, they're even having some legal action taken against them in some cases, or they're losing their licenses, or they're losing their jobs. I mean, that used to be unheard of, physicians being, right. quote, fired. And it's, I mean, that was part of the reason I wanted to go to medical school. I thought, gosh, this is going to be a great job. I'll make a good amount of money, and I will always have a job. Well, that's no longer the case. And um, so, anyway, the environment for the, the physician who wants to practice clinically or who is practicing clinically, I feel like is much worse than it was even 10 years ago. But the environment for non-clinical careers or non-traditional careers is better. And that's been born from this bad clinical environment. So a lot of business people see an opportunity, which is good. Um, and then there are a lot of us who have spoken up over the years and are saying, you know, we're, we can help you or look at this opportunity or that opportunity. And then others take advantage of it and the word kind of spreads. That, that is really interesting. And again, you're kind of more on the front lines than and I am because you do coach, coach these uh, physicians who are into these malingering environments. Um, I'd like to kind of d dig a little bit deeper in, into that. Um, is, do you see, you know, are there certain environments that are worse than others? You know, is it more of the hospital environment? Is it, uh, is it affecting more younger doctors who may not have as much experience for them to, or the, may not feel that they can go in and, and uh, go against? Do you see it more in the corporate? Is there, is there any kind of area or is it, is that too hard to, to kind of stereotype a certain area? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it really doesn't distinguish. So I actually think the younger doctors are maybe the best off at this point, not in mm. terms of residency, because it's just a vile time and place and people are treated just abhorrently in residency in some places. And you still see those stories. And now there are blogs out there. So you can, you can read the stories. I, I just read one last week. I forget which one it was, but on some forum, someone posted something, you know, there's a ton of stuff out there. Um, but for different physicians of different ages, different genders, even foreign grads versus medical grads, it can, or U.S. medical grads, it, it can still be difficult for both. Um, I, I spoke with a, a foreign grad the other day who um, was telling me about the environment for him and some of his colleagues, and um, they are having to put up with just it sounds like a little bit more than they should and I'm not a hundred percent sure if it's because they're foreign medical grads or not but he seems to think they are so you know you, you only really see one side in some of these conversations and um, so I'm not sure but I have heard that from others so that may be a piece of it as well um, the older physicians are having somewhat of a hard time with the transition to the electronic medical record. Um, some of them just flat out can't do it or won't do it. And some of them can and will, but the administration isn't willing to give them a chance. Um, or they're just piling so much work. It's, it's non-sustainable for almost anyone. Um, so yeah, it's, it's tough um, in a lot of different places places. And you find it in different pockets from academic medical centers to private medical centers. Um, it does not um, distinguish, unfortunately. So I want to shift gears um, yeah. just a bit because um, I know there's probably doctors listening to one. It's like, oh no, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, can't keep this positive. Um, yeah. But there is a lot more you know, discussion. Uh, you know, I like, I like what you said about non-traditional uh, careers as opposed to non-clinical careers because I could consider telemedicine is a clinical but it's not traditional but that, that's kind of semantics but I was recently uh, talking with a friend who's not a doctor and he was like telling me you know um, 
he has a business where he markets to doctors. He says, I can't find doctors on, on social media. And I said, that's because they're, they're there. They just don't let you know they're there. And I said, did you know one of the largest groups is a Facebook group dedicated to uh, side gigs for physicians? You know, it's, I think last check, it's like 23,000. Um, have you noticed, you know, because of this influx, is it getting harder to find a quote non-clinical job just because there's so much interest in it? Because I've talked to a few of my own clients and they think that, you know, once they quit, like jobs will be plentiful for them. Uh, it seems like it's getting more and more competitive for these type of jobs. Or is there an influx of more opportunities that, that uh, you know, I'm just not aware of? Yeah. So there are definitely more opportunities, which is good, but it's getting more competitive because where it used to be a trickle of physicians applying for some of the more low hanging fruit, like the utilization review or the telemedicine jobs. Now it's, you know, a faucet. There are just lots and lots of physicians applying. So they have made the requirements more stringent at times. And sometimes those requirements don't need to be so stringent, but because there are so many applicants, the companies feel like they can. Um, and I, I definitely want to talk about um, more of the positive stuff, but I, I do have to mention another somewhat negative part about all of this is um, some of the salaries have actually gone down or the pay has gone down for some of those more low hanging fruit jobs because they they can get it. Um, there's so many physicians who want out and want more flexibility or want non-traditional work that they're willing to take $75, $80 oh, an wow. hour. Yeah, it's ridiculous versus what 110 120 which is still pretty low, but I mean, there's a pretty big difference there. And so although we've kind of come together um, as physicians to try to um, not stand for that and not accept that low pay, um, there's talk, but I, I think people are still accepting it because they're just desperate and they want out and, um, and it's better than, you know, working at Starbucks or something like that. And they, they don't know what else to do. I mean, that's, that's the other problem is it's hard to find information on the different opportunities that are not the low hanging fruit, like the utilization review work or telemedicine work or expert witness work, which not everyone wants to do either IME work, things like that. One of the things I also noticed too, I was talking with a, um, just because there, there is people going into trying to get these non-traditional jobs, I think you have to do your due diligence. Um, I've seen now where, because there's so much opportunity and particularly in, so like in the telemedicine space, I, I'm noticing, you know, I, I recently talked to a colleague and he was going to say, hey, I'm, I joined this telemedicine group but they're going to be prescribing medications online without a physical exam, mm -hmm. or they're going to be selling me crutches or braces and they're going to put it on Medicare. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> mm -hmm. There are, you definitely, as a physician, you definitely need to do your due diligence uh, because there are these big cases now and these telemedicine, these telemedicine companies, not all, not saying anything, but there are definitely people who are trying to use your license you know, to make a buck and you, whether or not it's legal or not legal, you need to be very careful. Have you, have, have you come across any of these type of companies? I certainly have seen them, but um, just kind of want to know your thoughts or have you worked with doctors who may have come across these type of things? Absolutely. And I have done a lot of due diligence to the point of calling the companies and pretending like I was going to oh, wow. be applying for the work just to get the information because I'm a lot more savvy only because I've been out there for longer, I've been doing this for longer. So I feel like with my clients, I can help them out by giving them not only a, a second opinion, but also the experience that I've gotten over the years just in the business world and interacting with these companies and maybe pick up things that they may not. So the people I work with appreciate that. But what I found is avoid those companies. Um, there is a lot of shady stuff that's happening. There are a lot of loopholes that some smart people are trying to take advantage of. And when something happens, the ones who are going to take the fall are going to be the physicians and their license. Yep. And so avoid those like the plague, the DME, the durable medical equipment, avoid that right now. Um, 
any kind of prescribing, especially any kind of pain medication, pain creams, stuff like that. Um, make sure if you're looking at a telemedicine job that there's some kind of electronic portal, that there's some option for a video conference. Um, and, and that's not always the case. You don't have to have a video conference. There just has to be that option. But And, and you know, all the legal aspects are kind of beyond the scope of this podcast. But um, definitely do your due diligence on these companies because um, it's, this is a gross generalization, but I would say probably a third of them are shady and they're going to, they're going to end up taking a fall real soon. Yeah. 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 I, again, you know, the telemedicine and it, it, it differs for each unique state. I know in California, for example, you can't prescribe if you've never done, like you've actually laid hands on the patient, but every state is different. Montana is different in California. Uh, Etc. But yeah, um, I'm glad. I'm glad that because that, that's something that not a lot of people talk about. And these, every now and then you'll see it on the forum. Hey, I got this job. Does this sound legit? You mm-hmm. gotta know when you're gut. <laughs> mm-hmm. You gotta well, know when you're gut. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it sounds great. That's the problem. Right. I mean, it sounds amazing. You do it from anywhere, anytime. They're willing to pay. They're quick to get back to you. Well, there's a reason for that. Um, <laughs> they they need someone, and they need your license, and they need your degree. Right, right, and uh, you know it's kind of the kind of those things that that uh, you know a lot of people talk about non clinical jobs, but not, but you know again there are definitely companies that are taking advantage of it. We keep talking about negative stuff. So. I know, I know. Let's get into the positive. Let's yeah. get into the positive stuff. So if you, you know, a doctor's listening to this, for someone who's working right now, maybe they're working full time, maybe they're looking to, um, you know, reduce the amount of hours. They're looking into non-clinical careers, but they don't have the experience or they don't know where to start. Um, Kind of an overgeneralization, I know that, but what kind of advice, what kind of things can they be doing right now if they're looking to transition into a non-clinical career? Yeah. So the best thing you can do right now is free and you can do it yourself. And it seems kind of contrary to what you might think because... I know most people expect to get a list of different things that they can look into and then they choose one of those and that's it. But that is not the best way to go about doing this. You really need to look at yourself first. Where do you want to be one, three to five years from now? How much money do you want to be making? What location do you want to be in? I I know some of this is impossible to predict, but you can put together a plan, at least a skeleton of a plan somewhat easily, and that's going to guide you. Um, Because the perfect job is not the perfect job if you're not living, say, near your family and you need to because you have aging parents, or um, for some reason you just have to return to, I I don't know, Sacramento for some reason. And if you're not there, your your life is just not worth it. And (laughs) I mean, again, a gross generalization, but you really need to figure out where you want to be. Um, Then taking a look at how you work best. Do you work best from home? Do you work best going to an office? Um, Understanding those things is very, very helpful. Um, Now, at some point, you do have to look at the realities. So what is really available to you as well? Um, What age are you? And I'm not talking about age discrimination at all. I'm just talking about do you have time to gain a skill set that you may need to gain if that's what you want to do? So if you really, if you're burning desires to go to law school, great. But does it make sense to pay the money, go, spend the time getting that degree and then working up a little bit because there's always going to be that um, that working up from any new job. So maybe instead you look at law careers that aren't going to require a law degree and maybe it's not being a JD or an Esquire. I forget exactly what it is. Um, Lynn Marie was coaching me on what it <laughs> means to be a full attorney. I thought it was just a JD degree, but it's much more than that. Hey, you're not um, the only one who she's coached. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love you. <laughs> I know, we, we both do. Um, but, but anyway, so maybe just then, okay, great. So you got, you know you want, want to be in the legal field. You're fascinated by that. You want to combine that with your medical background. Awesome. You don't have to be an attorney. So that helps you then start to cull down on different things rather than just opening up a book of just a thousand different careers, getting overwhelmed, um, or jumping straight to telemedicine or utilization review. Um, I do want to add the caveat, though, that 
those careers are low hanging fruit for a reason. So it is still somewhat, I don't want to say easy, but if you want to get into that, you, it's going to probably be a shorter road than completely changing your career. And if that is your only option, if you are a certain age, you have certain family obligations, you have a spouse or kids or aging parents or whatever the case, there's all kinds of different situations. Um, you may, your dream may be to go into the legal field, but it just doesn't make sense because you're looking at, at your life and on a big picture level. So, you know, again, first step is to kind of check yourself, spend some time reflecting and don't spend two years, then that's two years wasted, but mm -hmm. you don't have to pay a lot of money. You don't mm -hmm. have to do um, anything real crazy. It's, it's really just being honest with yourself and what you want. And then you can start going to some conferences or paying someone to help you. Um, but I, I've had too many people that have paid me a lot of money to help them and we've gotten a lot done, but they didn't do this first step. And then because of that, they're still working clinically. They have an amazing resume and they're ready to do something else, but, um, they, they just, they haven't gotten past um, really knowing where they want to be. And so finding those right opportunities. You're preaching to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> You're preaching to the choir. Um, you know, I'm a big stickler on, um, you know, that doctors, they, they, they love to get more degrees on their name. Uh, I have a friend who, who ran the MBA program at John Hopkins. And he would say, I would ask him, I'd say, how many of the doctors are actually using it? You know, he says, unfortunately, not as many as what we hope for. You know, there's some who would definitely, or they really mind going to administration, et cetera. But then there are some, you know, they're looking for something else to do. And, you know, they want to pay $35,000 a year for uh -huh. to do that. And I said, you know what, if there is a job out there that you want, and there's someone who's doing what you want to do, instead of paying all that money, ask to shadow them for a week. Yes. To see if that's something you want to do for a few days, just to see if this is something that you want because the grass isn't always greener just because it's quote is maybe non-clinical. Um, you know, it just might be in the situation. You know, I, I was in medicine and then I was in, out of medicine and then went back in, uh, I have my own uh, clinic because I still like medicine, but I wanted to live on my own terms. Uh, we have an insurance uh, free type clinic. We do med spa work and that kind of thing. But I enjoy that yeah. aspect of it. Uh, just, just because, it was different, you know, just because it's, it's different or non-clinical, that doesn't necessarily mean it's something that you may want to do, uh, that you could still, you know, like myself, still enjoy medicine, but medicine is so broad. There's still different opportunities that you can get into. So don't just, you know, just for someone who's, I'm in clinical, I want Alan out, you know, don't completely close that door. That, that's, that's my two cents on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, very astute. And I, I find that most people have that um, experience when they're kind of starting to look at non-clinical and they go back and forth. And it's, it's really hard to figure out because you don't know if you like something until you do it. Um, so there's a little bit of that as well. Um, so another thing you can do is really get some freelancer project work. And there's yep. tons of that available now, much more than there even was five years ago. And so sign up for some of these sites, freelancer, um, Fiverr, there's a ton of them. Upwork.com. Yep. 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 And that's another one. Yep. Flex jobs and just get some experience doing something else and figure out, first of all, do I like this? Second of all, You'll, you'll have some projects under your belt and experience. And so that's the value that you bring. It unfortunately isn't the fact that you're a doctor, although we all know we can do anything and it makes us amazing people. <laughs> Anyone who wants that's to hire right. us may look at that and they may think, okay, um, they don't have experience in banking or finance. And so, you know, next, who's the next applicant kind of thing. Right. It's, uh, there's a lot of stuff out that are still out there. And I'm glad we kind of ended on a positive note. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking about positive, we've got an event coming up in April uh, called the Physicians, it's a mouthful, Physicians Helping Physicians Celebration and Network Meeting for PHPCNM. Yes. I'm going <laughs> to... Love gonna, it. Let, <laughs> let's talk about why you decided to put on an, an event. I believe this is the first 
I guess, big event that you, you've put on before? And, and why should doctors who listen to this, why should they come to this uh, besides meeting us, of course? <laughs> Right. Yeah, I know. So I have been thinking about this for a very long time. And as we talked about, we've been in this space for a long time ourselves, not only looking at something different, but helping others do something different. Um, and at, at some point, I feel like bringing us all together makes us stronger. It also is meeting people and hearing about their experiences in person can't be beat. You, you cannot get that experience with Facebook groups. You cannot get that experience with podcasts. You can get a little bit of it, but it is not the same as coming together and actually meeting people, hearing their story live, hearing their advice live. And I've had that experience myself going to other conferences. And so I finally decided to, to do it. I, I've, toyed with the idea. I actually had two other conferences scheduled over the years and I ended up canceling them because it wasn't the right time and um, it wasn't working out the way that um, I felt like it would be the best experience for the attendees. And when I decided to try it again, I have an, a small army of people behind me helping me this time, other physicians. Um, I call them the founding members and they've agreed to really help me with putting this event on. And then other people kind of came out of the woodwork. Um, so again, timing. So people like you, people like Lynn Marie, um, people like spokesperson. She's been an anchor for over 25 years and she's going to come and speak and do some helping with um, just presenting yourself. And if you want to get on TV, how to do it. So it feels right this time, and, and that's evidenced by the amount of people who have already signed up to come. We have over 60 people already signed up for the first time, and that's pretty amazing um, it, for a live event because people have to travel there, and they have to take time off, and so I'm so grateful to those who have already signed up, and um, it's just going to be an amazing experience for everyone. People will get to hear about the different options um, in a non-clinical career, so if you're even considering it at all, you can find out what other people have done and hear their story and find out how hard it was for them. Um, there's going to be tons of networking. So um, one of the benefits of what I've done is built a network of people. Easier. I'm, please don't hear that. I'm not guaranteeing anyone a job. It happens all the time where you'll be speaking to someone who's transitioned and they either are hiring or they know someone who's hiring and they're willing to help you because they understand and they've been there. Um, so that is just, that's the best way to get a job is networking anyway um, and a good job at that. So that's, that's what we're doing. And um, yeah, it's the first time, so it's a little scary, uh, <laughs> but I am doing everything I can to make it a great experience and um, hopefully it will be and it will be the first of many to come. Right, and so it's happening April 6th and 7th in Austin, uh, Texas. Yes. Um, I do, uh, according to your website, the, uh, the hotel, uh, just want to make sure it is not sold out. Uh, you're, you have a block of rooms, apparently that may be gone, but th there is space at the hotel. Is, is that correct, at least at the time of this recording? That's right. As of this recording right now, and today's the 6th, yeah, today's the 6th of March, um, the hotel is not sold out, so you can still book a room at the conference hotel. The uh, block of rooms that I reserved has been sold out now for a little over a month, so, um, but they didn't give us a huge discount anyway. It's the first time that the conference is being held, so you're not really missing out by not getting that discount. Um, there is still space. I will close the registrations um, at some point in the next couple of weeks uh, just because I don't want to overwhelm everyone and, and myself in making sure that I give a great experience to everyone and for practical reasons I have to give um, food numbers and things like that so um, if you haven't signed up yet you still have a week or two but please do it sooner rather than later because people registering in the next couple of days um, and I'll try to let everyone know when that happens and I'll start a waiting list at that point point. and where is the website where they go to to register yeah so the website is physicians helping physicians website um, it's www.p as in Paul H as in Henry 
physicians with an S on the end dot com. And if you go to that, you'll go to the home page and you'll see a button for the celebration meeting. You can click on that and it'll take you to the page where you can register. Um, the conference is donation only, so you can choose to donate or not. Um, I would appreciate a small donation just to cover the food expenses, but um, this is the first time I'm having it, and so I want to make sure that everyone gets value out of it. Um, next year, there will be a required registration fee, so this, take it. Advantage now of the donation only. Are you there? Yeah, sorry, you've been oh, cutting out. That's no okay. <laughs> okay. Yep. Nope. Um, so that's that's it. That that, that that's great, and uh, that donation only. That 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 is true, and I definitely know it uh, can be very expensive to run events, especially with food and hotels trying to jack up the price and charging waters for <laughs> for five or ten bucks on there. Believe me, I, I know that. So <laughs> uh, I, you know, Michelle's very generous with the donations. I would advise you to donate on the higher side if you can, because it, it just helps pay everything out. And um, and I guess this is the first time I'm actually hearing it, is that there might be a second one. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 As, as long as, as this is successful, and we'll be doing surveys after the fact, um, as long as it works for everyone, then, um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to start doing this on a yearly basis. And if it We may move the location at some point. We may have multiple locations. Um, it all remains to be seen. Let's get through the first one. <laughs> all right, right. Again, again uh, it's coming up on April 6th and 7th in Austin, Texas. The uh, Physicians Helping Physicians Celebration and Networking Meeting, or PHPCNM, hashtag. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. As we know it. Uh, it I hope you can come. I'll be there. I want to look forward, but I haven't met you before. Come there. Um, and uh, if you heard us on, on the call, let me know. And uh, I would we'll love to, to chat with you to see what your plans are, what your, what your dreams are, are happening now. Because there is, uh, there is tremendous opportunity. We'll end up optimistic now. There is tremendous opportunity uh, that, that is out there. But like you said, the, the best best jobs, if, if that's what you're looking for, the best jobs aren't usually advertising. It comes from networking by going to events uh, such as what we're having. Michelle, thank you so much uh, on there. I know you got a lot planned, uh, especially with the event. Thank you for taking the time to join in with us on the podcast today. Oh, thanks for having me, Mike. Thanks again, guys. And as always, go ahead and sign up on that on the website. I'd love to see you at the meeting. And as always, keep moving forward. Thank you.